Welcome to another edition of the Law and Gospel Devotional. My name is Eric Sorensen, pastor of Hillside Church in Roxbury, New Jersey, as well as a contributor to 1517 in all sorts of ways, including gathering with you each and every Tuesday to look at a section of God's Word and find out what God's two words of both law and gospel have to say to us. Last week, we were in the Old Testament text from the series of lectionary texts, looking at Isaiah 50. This week, we're back in the epistle of James because it turns out that there's quite a few readings from James in the lectionary texts. And this weekend's or this this week's uh, text, well, not surprisingly, being from James is going to have a lot of commands. It's going to tell us a lot of what we're doing wrong and a lot of what we ought to do. And so how is it that we're going to find both law and gospel in our text today? Well, we'll pull up our slides and we'll do just that. We'll find out the answer to that question in just a second. So uh, first of all, what are we talking about here today? Well, if I could basically summarize the passage, which is James 3, 13 through 4, 10, I would say that it's similar to what Luther said in the first of his 95 theses, which is essentially that all of the Christian life is one of repentance. All of life is repentance. Indeed, it's impossible to read the passage we're going to look at today without being brought to repentance if you are an honest Christian. It just is the reality. So, so with that being said, first of all, what we're going to see is James point out for us what wisdom looks like. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. All right, that sounds simple enough. The wise and understanding are not just those who know stuff. This is very important to understand about wisdom. Wisdom is, well, it's also shown in action. It's shown through things we do. So it's possible to know the right things and yet, and know a lot of things, and yet, well, frankly, be very unwise. Any of us who have had friends that maybe have done exceptionally well in school and yet have made foolish life decisions know exactly what this text is talking about. No, James says wisdom, it, it shows itself in good conduct, in works, and yet it's not boastful. It's done in meekness. Wisdom, wisdom doesn't look necessarily impressive. It's, there's a quietness to wisdom, James points out here as he uses the word meek to describe it. So that's what wisdom looks like. Well, what does wisdom not look like? Or to put it another way, what does wisdom from the pit of hell look like? Well, he tells us, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Remember what I said about wisdom. Wisdom is this meek thing, James says, but boasting and False wisdom is, of course, loud and wants everybody to know that at least you're looking or trying to get noticed for your wisdom. He says, no, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic for where jealousy and selfish ambition exists. There will be disorder in every vile practice. Well, tell us what you really think, James. If you've read the epistle of James before, then you know that James has no problem getting to <laughs> the core of the issue and calling out sin where he finds it. The reality is, is the people that he's writing to apparently did suffer with this. There apparently was a lot of jealousy and indeed a lot of selfish ambition. And of course, we'd be lying if we said today that we didn't struggle with those same things. In fact, it infects all of us to one degree or another. No matter how holy one's ambition might be, if we're honest, we recognize that in every holy ambition, there still is a bit of selfish ambition at the very least. Even when we're doing, I can tell you this, as a person who planted a church in New York City, there was holy ambition there. I wanted to see sinners come to know Jesus. I wanted to see people saved. But I'd be lying to you if I also didn't want credit from time to time. If I didn't want to be noticed for that, I'm not proud of it. And yet it's a reality that sticks with all of us. It is this problem. And so James warns us against that and says, you know, if you're being driven by that, 
will know that you're being driven by something demonic. It's bad. Yes, indeed. And it does cause all sorts of problems, as James notes. And one doesn't have to look too far to see how those problems manifest themselves even in the church today. You know, I'm reminded when I think about what James is picturing here of just somebody that is driven entirely by their own glory. And I can't help but think of, well, a somewhat famous quote from the former Dallas Cowboys wide receiver Terrell Owens, who once said, and this is true, I love me some me. Well, (laughs) I suppose you could say at least he was honest. I love me some me. Well, that is what James is warning against. Don't be driven by I love me some me. Instead, you ought to be driven by I love me some others. Well, that said, let's get back to what wisdom looks like. James points out in contrast to that sort of hellish wisdom from below. He says in verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason. I I really like that being noted here. This is somebody that's reasonable. Uh, Somebody who's wise is somebody that is willing to consider different arguments and different points of view. It doesn't mean that they give up on the fundamentals of the faith. It doesn't mean that they're they're going to be wishy-washy on matters of doctrine. No, that's not what it's saying. But nevertheless, there's a spirit of gentleness. There's, again, that word meekness that James mentioned in the very beginning. He continues, a person who's wise is full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Well, I think all of us can give a hearty amen to that. Yes, that is how we ought to live. I mean, if you ask me, do I want to live in a peaceable way? Do I want to be gentle to people? Do I want to be open to reason and full of mercy and full of good fruits and partial and sincere? Yes, I do. I want that. Of course. It's good. These are good things. We all know that. It's almost common sense what James is saying here. And yet... As we all know, that does not accurately describe us because, well, we're all a mixed bag. And that's what James is going to get into next, really the source of our problems. As Walter White famously said, I am the source. Well, Walter White's not the source. In fact, I am the source because, folks, the simul is real. What I mean when I say the symbol, that's shorthand for Luther's famous phrase, simultaneously saint and sinner. How does James say it in verse or chapter four, verse one? What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? Yes, indeed it is. This is hearkening us back to the words of Paul that tells us there's a battle between the flesh and the spirit in Galatians 5. Or again, the words of Paul in Romans 7, where he says, that which I do not want to do, I keep on doing. Yes, yes, as much as we may want to deny it, we are simultaneously saint and sinner, and therefore we are prone, we are struggling with giving in to that which is not good. In other words, what he says is jealousy and selfish ambition. It's It's there with us, even if we're fighting the battle against it. And so what does it look like when the flesh runs amok? Well, he describes it pretty vividly in verse 2. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. James point here is that when we're driven by these passions that are not good, that are not holy, well, then it brings chaos and destruction. It causes fighting and it causes that which leads to murder. And in fact, it causes us to have a prayer life that asks for all the wrong things because we're desiring all the wrong things. In other words, none of this is good. (laughs) It's not a pretty picture of what drives the flesh. And what does that make us when we are being driven by the flesh? Well, by nature, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 5, 
We all naturally are enemies of God. And when we act like this, it's as, it's, we're acting as if we are enemies of God. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy, jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Now, a quick side note here, a couple things about this quote unquote scripture quotation from James. First of all, to the best of our knowledge, as we scour the Old Testament, there doesn't seem to be any scripture that actually says the words James quotes here. There are scriptures that allude to the truth that James is quoting here, but there is no scripture that we know of that says these exact words. That's the first thing, just as a side note. It could be that it is from something that James had read in a different translation that he is putting into, uh, into his epistle according to that translation that just doesn't seem to quite match up with what we have. The second thing to note here is that scholars have different points of view on how to interpret this last section, that scripture passage. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Who is the he there? Well, some scholars say that that is talking about God, that God yearns for us to be in right fellowship with him instead of being enemies with him. That would make sense, and certainly that would fit. However, there's also some that see this as a warning about how uh, our natural spirit that God has given us, every one of us is born with spirit, even if we're not regenerated, we are spiritual people. Some see this as warning against the tendency towards being jealous or envious ourselves and that that drives all the chaos and problems that James warns about in our passage. The fact is, we can't know exactly for sure how to interpret this. But the point is, one way or another, James is pointing out that this course of action that his readers have been taking has led to all sorts of disaster. It's led to all sorts of problems. Folks, it's obvious to see that what James is doing here is exposing and convicting his readers with the law on blast. He's not subtle. He's not hinting. He is saying, when you act like this, you are acting as if you are an enemy of God. That is the reality of sin. This is what the law does. It's not something we want to hear. We'd rather minimize it. We'd rather have it soft-pedaled to us. We'd rather have our ears tickled. It's true. And yet, because we are simultaneously saint and sinner, the flesh needs to hear it. It needs to hear the unbridled truth. Because then, when we recognize that each of us has this tendency, and each of us can fall into this trap of being selfishly motivated and driven by selfish ambition and jealousy, when we recognize that that is a part of us, well, then, then instead of minimizing it, well, we're ready for grace. That's what James immediately says after throwing down the gauntlet, throwing down the hammer of the law. He immediately says, but God gives more grace. What's the solution to the problems that James spells out for us here? It's not more work. It's not be better or else. No, it is, but he gives grace more grace. Folks, in Christian theology, grace is always the solution because it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that you are made a child of God. It's just like Titus says, that it is grace that trains us to renounce un godliness. It is the reality that we have been forgiven by Jesus Christ because of all that he's done for us that indeed transforms us. That is what 
That's where the power comes from. So James doesn't point us back into ourselves after he, after he floors us with the law, but no, he points our gaze upward. He points our gaze to the God who has mercy on us. Yes, that's the solution to our problems. And so James says in verse 6 of chapter 4, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Yes, we've just been humbled by the reckoning that each of us is prone to selfish ambition. But that does not mean in our humility that we're hopeless. No. What does it say? God is in the business of giving grace to the humble. Or maybe better put here, to the humbled, to those who recognize their sin. Yes, what humility looks like is the tax collector standing outside of the temple and beating his breast, just crying out, have mercy on me, a sinner. The solution to your problem is not more do more, try harder. It is, in fact, I have not done it. Please forgive me. James says it this way, verse 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Isn't it great the way that we resist the devil is by acknowledging that we failed, is by acknowledging that we need mercy? Yes, there's nothing the devil hates more than when someone cries out to God for mercy. That's the last thing he wants us to do because the devil knows that is indeed where our power is. Mercy from the throne of God. Draw near to God, James says, and he will draw near to you. Come boldly to the throne, not of judgment, but to the throne of grace, the author of Hebrews says. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. How? Well, because Jesus Christ has promised that everything he's done has cleansed your hearts. When you come to him, you are guaranteed complete and utter cleansing. Every part of you is reckoned as righteous in his sight. Though you are naturally double-minded, again, there's that simultaneously saint and sinner thing. On account of Jesus Christ, you are washed. You have been cleansed in the waters of baptism in the name of the triune God. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. This is repentance language. This is why I say ultimately this whole passage is about repentance. Instead of just laughing off or minimizing our sin, no, we ought to come boldly acknowledging our sin, acknowledging our failure so that we might receive mercy in our time of need, which is always and he concludes, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Yes, it's time for us each and every day <laughs> to stop trying to exalt ourselves, but to let him exalt us in his power and his strength by the forgiveness of our sins. When it's all said and done, what humility sounds like well, it sounds, it sounds like the confession of sin that my congregation used to do every single week in New York City. Each and every week, we would all say these words together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your condemnation. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will. And each and every week after we would say those words, confessing our sins and pleading for mercy, the very next words that would be spoken to the gathered people of God each time was, you are forgiven. Indeed, to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord is another way of just saying each and every day, I still need to know I'm forgiven. I still need what you have to give me. 
I'm still dependent on you each and every day. Yes, the whole of the Christian life is one of repentance because it is there that we find a merciful Savior. All right, gang, that is it for today. I hope that you have been blessed by our time together looking at both God's law and God's gospel. Have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. God bless.